Yeah. All right, and we're live. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. All probably zero of you. Nope, two. two. All two of you. Nice. Got two people already. I'm actually not quite ready. I'm getting my reference set up right now. Uh, let's see. YouTube. Your live streams. Today. Read. There we go. So, as you can see, male model, and uh, I tried to pick something that was a little bit interesting and not just like a straightforward standing type pose. So, we will see how it goes. Also, I have a delicious Coca-Cola here with me, which I'm going to drink right now, but probably not all at once. So, you guys are going to have to listen to me drink that. Ah, periodically. Okay, so got our pencil. There it is. And uh, probably zoom out a little bit as well. So this is going to be interesting. I haven't actually drawn anything this size for probably a week or two. Because, you know, it's been Christmas time. I've been busy doing stuff. But I did shoot some critiques the other day. I shot this one, which I thought turned out pretty cool. And... Uh, I don't know, I was happy with it. It was a tough pose because it has a lot of like foreshortening, you know, where her head and arms were really big and the legs a little bit smaller. You know, you can see we got student drawing and then kind of like the changes and corrections I would make on top. And this is essentially how our classes work. Like we film a new demo each week and, uh, you know, and then students draw their own drawing and then turn it in and then they get a video critique where I do a draw over in return. And this is a draw over, you know, where I sort of do my own version of it on top of their drawing. So they get like a one to one uh, comparison, you know, and they can see kind of how I'm redesigning this arm and getting the overlaps to work a little bit differently and uh, pushing the proportions a little bit more. You know, in this case, I shrank the head just a little bit change the knees. I mean, you know, it's changed a number of things. Anyway, I don't know. I figured somebody might like to see that. And then this is the stuff I usually end up posting on Instagram. I'm not sure I have anything else worth looking at. I mean, I've got like a whole pile of these over here, essentially. But that's probably not what you came here to see. My guess is that you probably came here to see See me draw a figure. So let's do it. Some people wrote stuff. Greetings from Colombia. That's cool. Welcome from San Diego. And uh, thanks for the live streaming. You're welcome. Happy New Year and thanks. Yeah, definitely. Happy New Year. Buenas noches. Does that mean... Good evening, good night. Oh, welcome. Okay, so let's get it started. Let's figure out kind of what I need to do here. Sorry, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit because this is kind of tall. I don't know exactly how big this thing's gonna be yet. And so I'll usually start by just kind of figuring out where I want it placed on the page, right? So we're gonna say, uh, let's put the top of his head right up here you know, about like that. And then we'll kind of put the bottom of the foot. Let's say, let's see, let's see if I can get it on screen. Bottom of the foot will go roughly about here, probably. I usually try to draw a full page, but uh, you can see if I zoom all the way out to get the whole page on there, it's, uh, it gets really small on the screen, which I'll do for my demo videos, but for YouTube, maybe not quite so much. And we'll start with a couple quick measurements, right? Like maybe find where is the halfway point of the figure, right? So we'll kind of say, here's the top, here's the bottom, find our halfway point roughly about here. And this is the literal halfway point, not the anatomical halfway point, but the literal halfway point. And you can see, I just kind of make little adjustments as I go. Measure. 
measure. It seems like a pretty good halfway point. And then I'm gonna actually lean over here to my computer where I can see the reference and find the halfway point on here as well, which is about, uh, hmm. it's like just below where the shadow is on his glute. You know, it's like on his butt cheek, basically. There's like that shadow on it. Just a little bit below that, I think, is the halfway point. So just based on that alone, I can look and say like, okay, that means uh, the shadow for the glute is going to be just above our halfway point, which means the glute itself is probably going to drop down a little bit lower. You know, so we'll just kind of use that as a quick guide. And then uh, I'll kind of measure... Usually what I would do next is I would measure the head size, <clears throat> right? And then figure out how many heads there are to get down to the halfway point, right? And that would give us a head size. And then from there, we could kind of find a big shape. Like there's a number of different approaches we can take from that point, but that's usually a pretty good way to get started. But in this case, we're not really seeing much of his head. Like we're hardly seeing any of it, right? So I'm just going to guess. I mean, I could try to measure that little bit of head we're seeing, but it's, there's not much. So I'm just going to say we need some space here. Right, so can zoom in on here a little bit and just say like, okay, let's say we just move down a little bit, leave some room for the head there. And then I'm gonna find a nice sweep for the shoulders, right? They kind of start where the head is and kind of sweep down at an angle this way. Now, is that enough of an angle? I don't know, but I'm gonna check and find out real quick and just kind of loosely find an angle for the shoulders with my pencil. See if it kind of matches here. It's pretty close. I think I ain't, like made it curve maybe a little bit too much compared to his shoulders. Arguably that could be a good thing, but I don't know if I want to exaggerate it right off the bat. So let's straighten this out just ever so slightly. We'll say that's probably a good shoulder angle. And we'll come in here and kind of find where his neck is gonna sit. kind of like back up in here. So now we've got two points. So now we can say, okay, the seventh cervical vertebrae is sitting right here where these things meet, these two points, right? And you can see that on him really clearly. There's a bump, like his neck comes back and before it hits his shoulders, there's a big bump right there, which if we zoom in and look at it is probably, I was gonna say it could be part of the trapezius, but honestly, I don't think so. I think that's the seventh cervical vertebrae. We have one vertebrae on the back of our neck, kind of like between our shoulders and up just a little bit that like pokes out farther than all the others. And it's far enough to be visible and it's a pretty good landmark to look for. Uh, so his head's gonna sit kind of up in here. Roughly up in this space. We don't need to get too much of it yet. The reason I'm putting a little bit in is because I need to kind of know roughly where this shoulder is going to start and stop. So I'm just kind of guessing right now a little bit. Saying, so, okay, we get a head shape kind of out here, which means his shoulder is probably starting roughly about here. Right, swinging over here, finding that seventh cervical vertebrae, and then his other shoulder like way out here somewhere, right? And it's kind of like attaching about there maybe. Maybe not quite that far over. Pull it in a little bit. So we've got generally a head, neck, and shoulders. Right? Now we need to figure out what else we can do here. So the spine it's basically making a C curve that's a lot straighter at the bottom. Like it has a curve and then straightens out. And the reason for that is because he has a twist, right? Like he's twisting his torso. But if you think about it, the spine is fairly straight. So when we twist the spine, it still looks pretty straight. So really we're getting like the spine twisted, but still looking straight. And then his, he's like leaned forward a bit. He's like kind of like hunched forward and that's kind of causing this part to kind of curl this direction a bit. And then we get kind of like the straight part of the spine. 
kind of coming down that way. Now, before I go too much farther, we're going to come in here and just kind of get some things placed, right? Like this is enough that we can start looking for some big negative shapes and looking for the big shape of the entire figure here, right? So I'm going to zoom out on my reference. And roughly, I'm going to say the arm kind of goes out this direction, right? Remember, we're working with uh, C curves, S curves, and straights. That's it. At this point in the drawing, that's the only movement my arm's going to make. And I'm working pretty big, so I'm going to be mostly doing like shoulder and elbow type movements. But, you know, keep in mind that the way you use your arm kind of depends a lot on the size that you work at. And if you are, you know, working smaller, like you're an animator or comic book artist, you know, you'll probably be working from the wrist more and elbow. And then just the bigger stuff that you draw will be uh, more shoulder based. I know that's Something people talk about a lot is like, do you draw from the shoulder? Do you draw from the, the wrist? Answer is both, depending on what type of mark you need to make. There's no, no rules really. Okay, so remember the glute, the shadow for the glute goes just above here, right? So we got to keep that in mind as we kind of figure out roughly where this glute section is going to sit. Kind of out around this way. And it's going to kind of drop back down this direction. You get the bottom of the glutes around there. I'm kind of guessing on that right now. Uh, we're going to find just a big curve again for the shape of the torso here. Now that torso looks a little bit wide. to figure out why. I feel like this maybe comes out a little bit far. Maybe we can pull this in a little bit. It's a little better. That feels like a better width for his torso, right? Because we're seeing, since he's like has his torso twisted, we're, the shoulders are going to be a lot wider, and then we're seeing like his hips from the side. You know, so it's going to be a little bit challenging to draw, right? So we'll get the top of the hip somewhere around there, and then kind of dropping down this direction. You know, real quick, we can kind of see that the arm, there's going to be a little negative shape right in here between his arm and his torso, right? So we're going to come in and find kind of where that arm is going to sit here. So it's got to kind of come in this direction, back this way. It's got to find a good width for this arm, right? And at this point, we're just sticking with gesture, and that is it. Nothing more. Right? His arm's kind of going down past his glute right here. Like, we can see it past there. And then we see a little bit of his hand grabbing onto the chair. Kind of like right down around there. And, you know, at this point, again, all we're trying to do is just get things properly placed on the page, you know, without too much trouble, hopefully. So let's work maybe on these legs a little bit. So we're going to have our leg kind of starting here, which, remember, if the halfway point, again, was just... Was it below the shadow? I th now I can't remember. I think it was a little bit below that shadow. It was right on the shadow. It was pretty close to where the shadow goes. 
Uh, that means our hip section actually needs to move up a little bit. Right, because remember this shape right now includes both uh, glutes, right? So the actual separation between the glutes is like here. And then we're seeing a little bit of the far glute kind of drop down this way. You know, we'll have the arm, or not the arm, the leg, sorry. Coming out this way, right? Sticking with a nice big C curve to describe just the angle of that leg. Right, again, checking our direction. Making sure it kind of matches the reference. Right now, that's pretty close. Right, we're gonna have a big negative shape out here again for the arm. So we got an arm coming out this way. To figure out roughly how long we want it to be, which is gonna be a little bit challenging. One way we can do that is use a plumb line and say, well, what's directly across from the elbow? It's kind of like just a little bit below this shoulder. So if we go down a little bit below the shoulder, cut across, I think our elbow is going to sit roughly about here. All right, so the rest of that arm is going to cut in this direction. Use a plumb line from the elbow. Hopefully to kind of figure out where the knee is going to sit. And the knee comes just a little bit past that point, right? Kind of comes down a little bit past there. And kind of wraps back around this way. Now this foot's going to be a challenge because this whole leg is coming out towards us quite a bit. You know, so we're going to have to figure out how to get our foot placed. So roughly the ankle, I think, kind of lines up with the back of this arm. So again, if we kind of draw a plumb line straight down, our ankle is going to sit kind of in line with that point. So we can come in here and maybe find... where the foot's going to sit. You know, again, looking for a nice gesture. This foot's way too wide right now, but I'm going to adjust it in a minute. I found this part first, and then I'm kind of finding the back part to make sure the width is correct right in here. <clears throat> right, and then we're going to come back and adjust the placement of things here. Now notice <clears throat> I'm dropping below that mark that I made for the, the bottom of the drawing. That's okay, right? Because things grew a little bit, you know, like this didn't line up quite the way I thought it would either. And this also got pushed down a little bit. But as long as it happened pretty consistently and the drawing still looks okay, I'm not going to worry about it too much. It's a pretty good foot size, I think, in shape. Right, 
where's the rest of the gesture here? Four. So the gesture is mostly established. You know, we can maybe get the rest of this arm on here, figure out how big that needs to be, which feels a little bit small to me right now. I think I know why. I think it's the angle of it that's off, right? So again, I'm gonna just do a quick measurement, check my angle. Yeah, I think the angle is a little bit off. So we'll come in here, adjust the angle, bring it down a little bit more. Notice where that hits our plumb line changes a little bit, but I think that's okay too. Because that gets us the length that we need on the arm, but that tells me that that plumb line that I used was a little bit off, and this shoulder probably needs to drop down a little bit lower, right? So you can kind of see like drawing is really, it's like a problem solving type thing, you know? If you don't enjoy problem solving, then you're gonna have a tough time drawing because that is a big part of what, what it involves. So that makes more sense, right? So now a little bit below here, cut over and pretty much hit where that plumb line should go. Connect up this arm here. comes out that way, sweeps back around this way, right? We're getting a lot of foreshortening on this arm. And then the hand is sitting roughly about here. And let's see. So one thing that's challenging on this one is this other leg. to figure out a good gesture for this leg. It's gonna to have to start, starts a little bit above the shadow, which was kind of the halfway point. I'm gonna make it kind of even with that halfway point because remember things dropped a little bit. I'm gonna say it just kind of comes out this way and we get the knee kind of coming out a little bit past this one, but not a lot, but it basically comes out here, comes back in a little bit, and the whole thing is kind of cutting back this way, but that leg is super compressed. And then the foot is like right in here. And it's being pressed up against that leg, so I'm not gonna draw more of it than that right this second, because it's gonna be kind of challenging to draw. And it's going to be dependent on getting the calf in there and things like that. I think this is off to a good start. I think it's a decent gesture. So next we need structure, right? So we've got to come in here and see if we can start finding kind of how, to, how this thing sits in space. Right, and turn it into like more of like a three-dimensional image and see if we can get it placed. I'm just kind of double checking where that shoulder is gonna go. Right, so we're looking up at him quite a bit, or at least we're looking up at the top of half of him and he's got a bit of a twist. You know, the arm is kind of going away from us. This one's going away from us. We've got this one kind of just going straight down and then we've got this leg coming out towards us, right? So this is where we really start thinking about cylinders and boxes and basic shapes and start seeing if we can figure out kind of some of these cylindrical three-dimensional type forms, right? And then at this point, we're going to start focusing on overlaps a little bit more as well, right? Because overlaps help add depth to our drawing. 
we're going to come in here and start adding also maybe some little anatomical indications. Right, so adding a little bit more of rectus femoris, you know, and, and kind of double checking our anatomy. It's kind of sitting here, coming down, and then hitting the, <clears throat> the knee out here. You know, so you can see, like, we're literally thinking of this as a cylinder. Saying, like, if this was a cylinder, what would it look like? You know, we're just kind of like plugging it into that space. Same thing, this leg, the knee's coming out towards us a bit. And the foot's kind of back a little bit. So we're picking up a little bit of a cylindrical form here that's kind of turned back towards us, but not as much as this one, right? Like this leg's coming out towards us quite a bit, and then he's got his leg twisted in a way where this is kind of like a little bit flatter, you know, and more in profile. Uh, the upper part, and we're seeing the hip from the side, so I don't know that we need to worry too much about the boxy structure of the hip, uh, but we're definitely looking up at him you know, and so we're picking up this <clears throat> like big uh, kind of cylindrical type shape of the torso. Kind of running across here a little bit. And then we've also got some shoulder blades and things. I also think we need to shrink this section a little bit more you know so we're kind of going in and just like dialing it in and and working our way up to like the next level of detail Got kind of this boxy shape. Kind of up in here. You know, we get some of the lat cutting back in. There's also some shoulder blades up in here. And then he's also got a rib cage, right? Of course. I mean, rib cage sitting in here. Almost forgot, but there's definitely some rib cage. And you can see it sticking out right here in the reference, right? We get the lat cutting back this direction. And then we're seeing a little bit of the pec as well, right? Just like a little bit of pectoralis. And then we're getting the rib cage and the oblique. I don't know. You might see some serratus there, but it's in shadow. It's not super clear. I don't know that we need to worry about that too much. So much as just this kind of rib cage shape up in here. Kind of cutting it back this way. And then we get the bottom, you know, part of the rib cage cutting back this direction. And then of course we get the oblique dropping down this way. You know, so now it's starting to look a little more three-dimensional. You know, this arm is going away from us, so we can get maybe a little bit more shoulder on here. But then we have to think of this as, once again, a cylinder. You know, and make sure that our cylinder reads properly. 
because that's really going to help with our overlaps. Overlaps are critical. You know, and then we get this one for the forearm. maybe back up in here you know using a boxy shape for the wrist no we're not seeing much of the hand it's mostly covered by the chair uh, this far arm it's mostly in profile we're not seeing like a lot of cylindrical shape but what we are seeing is mostly kind of looking up at it a little bit right here Probably here as well, just ever so slightly. And then probably more in profile down here. Now, one thing that's really challenging is these legs where that get you know compressed and folded as far as they go they're always a challenge to draw i always have a hard time with them you know so we're gonna have to spend a little bit of time kind of figuring out what to do with this shape that's not bad actually maybe kind of simplify this section going out too far oops this is always a challenge yeah because we need this really subtle overlap right here and then it kind of curls around like that way, you know, and then we get the bone and stuff down here. That's probably pretty good. Let's um, try and get some trapezius and stuff on here. Actually, no, let's do a little bit more of the leg first. All right, let's get this calf on here. And, uh, right, so there's some landmarks we can look for. We have the head of the fibula, which we can see kind of poking out right about here. And it's roughly sitting about here. Yeah, I'm guessing a little bit, but partly that works because I've done this a lot. We could use some plumb lines and things and make sure it's in the right spot, you know. It just seems like it works pretty well. So our calf now, remember, it's kind of inserting up into the hamstring up here but everything is like compressed his legs bent so everything's kind of like getting a little bit squished and compressed in this area which always makes it work in a way that's a little more uh confusing and never it always looks a little bit different than, than you would expect when you get a lot of compression it's popping out and then kind of down so first we'll get gastrocnemius Right, which is usually the first part we see kind of popping out here. And then the soleus sits underneath gastrocnemius. And that'll be this part kind of right down there. Right, and then we have <clears throat> this kind of tendon here that we can see going back behind the ankle. Right, so we can see the ankle here roughly about there. Right, we see this tendon kind of sticking out here. That's coming from a muscle on the side of the leg. 
right here, there's a big muscle that sits on the side called peroneus longus. And then there's another smaller one that sits like kind of right below it called peroneus brevis, I think. I don't know. The, the two per peroneus muscles sit right along here, but they turn into tendon that comes down and drops behind the ankle. So that's that tendon we're seeing right there. And I'm going to kind of ignore it for a second. And then just kind of find a nice sweep back out to this heel. Then over here, we're seeing a little bit of the tibialis stick out, right? So we've got kind of bone, right? Because we've got the tibia up in here. The tibia from this angle is relatively straight, right? Maybe cuts in a little bit and then it's pretty straight, except for the bottom that like flares out a little bit. But generally speaking, from this angle, from the side, the tibia is relatively straight. From the front, it's got like a little bit of a curve to it not as much as people think. It's very easy to over curve it. But we just need to get a little bit of tibialis on here, right? Which is a muscle that attaches to the tibia and is sitting like about here. And we can add maybe a little bit more ankle. Just a little bit. We've got to make sure this leg and foot end up big enough, right? We're kind of looking up at them, so we should kind of end up with this effect where our leg and foot are a little bit bigger, and then this part feels a little bit smaller. I mean, it's not like super dramatic, but it's enough that, you know, we're picking up that foreshortening in there. And then I think I'm kind of even pushing it just a little bit more. Well, maybe not. I was going to say I was making the foot a little bit bigger and leg, but actually it feels pretty close. Not perfect, but pretty close. And that's one of the things you learn over time. As you get kind of better and better at drawing, you start to kind of figure out that like, you know what, this stuff actually doesn't have to be perfect. At least if you're working from reference, right? Like it doesn't actually have to match the reference 100%. It has to work well as a drawing. You know, so we can change things a little bit here and there. We can rotate things. We can do stuff with it. But it's a more advanced approach. When you're first starting out and you're first learning, you really have to kind of stick to copying the reference, right? Because at first, you don't know enough to not copy the reference. Like, the idea of changing it is kind of predicated on the idea that you know a lot about anatomy and the figure. And if you don't know a lot, then how are you going to be able to change it? I mean, it's not going to work, you know, at least not well. All right, just adding a little bit of hamstring on here. All right, kind of setting right about there. And that brings us to that foot. That is a tough foot to draw. The key, I think, is going to be to not draw too much which sounds weird, but because like if you zoom in there and kind of look at the foot, it's like crunched up and it's causing all these little wrinkles and like all this like detail to show up in there. And you can put that in like strategically, but I would do that more at the end. Right now we just need the big shape and to figure out how that foot is kind of seated up under there. Also, it's in shadow, which makes it hard to see. And then there's also glare on my laptop, which makes it even harder to see. So let's see. It's basically coming all the way up to this glute right up here. Right, so we have this glute coming out this way. A good time to kind of finalize our glute proportion here. Round that out a little bit. And then we get the foot kind of pressed right up against there. Kind of popping out this way. I just taught the foot class too, or a foot class. 
And one of the things we go over uh, a lot is the basic shapes of the foot. I mean, that's really one of the main points of the class is how to kind of understand those basic shapes and how they work. It's kind of what I'm focused on right now, right? So we get the heel back up in here. It's got a little bit of a bend to it. Seeing a little bit of it kind of pop out this way and then his foot's bent, right? Like it's pressed up against his leg. And so we're gonna get this overlap right in here this is a very awkward foot right like I mean that looks nothing like a foot right now which is fine it's okay for now The important thing really right now is that basic shape where we're seeing a little bit of the bottom of this box and then it's kind of being twisted in a way where now we're seeing like a little bit of the top of it here like his foot's kind of being twisted around that way you right and then we get the bottom glute because we're seeing both of them Next one kind of comes out from here and wraps around down under here. And rhythmically, that should kind of align with the rest of this leg right in here if we did it right. Yeah, it's pretty close. It's not, it's not perfect. Again, it's not like matching the reference 100% perfectly. But this would kind of come up this way. And we get this part coming back. I think it works. It's a little bit awkward, but so is the pose, you know? So we have to kind of clarify things, but then make sure the pose reads at the same time. You know, you can see the types of things, in fact, this might be cool to show, that I teach in my foot class, in case anybody's curious. The figure drawing from the last week of figure drawing class last term. We actually did some rendering, right? Head drawing. And somewhere I should have feet, right? But you can see it's all about like the structure of the foot. Like we can kind of see the boxy shape for the base and the wedge that kind of like attaches to it. You can see on each of these, that's kind of what I'm focused on, right? It's like a long box with a wedge on top. You know, even this part where we see it from the bottom or the back or the, you know, wherever. That's kind of what we want to look for. So here we're not seeing like a lot of the foot, but we're seeing the bottom of that box. And we've got to make sure that reads properly. Skip the page. Mm, hang on. Should be a second foot page. Oh, there, that's the other foot page. Right, but same thing, right? It's kind of like this boxy shape on the bottom with a wedge attached to it, you know? And then we get into the anatomy and you have like your tarsals and metatarsals and kind of, they kind of relate to different parts of these basic shapes that I'm using. But in this case, we're not seeing much of it and it's a little bit awkward it's kind of doing this maybe this would be better you know it's got that like kind of twist to it here If we were to run a contour line over it, it would be doing something like that. Like this. Again, it's an awkward foot position. There's no way around that. It's also a pretty awkward placement considering where it aligns with the uh, glutes.
one's looking pretty good though, I think, in terms of like basic shapes, stuff like that. Maybe we could play this down a little bit. So we can start to get into anatomy a little bit more, right? We started to do that with the leg. Now we need to come up here and add a little bit more anatomy into the torso and the arms. You know, we've got those basic shapes working pretty well. Uh, but we need to kind of layer the anatomy on top now and see if we can come in here and find uh, maybe where the shoulder blades are going to sit, <clears throat> which is going to be a bit challenging, right? Because he's got one arm pulled around this way which is gonna be pulling the shoulder blade over most likely. And then he's got this arm kind of pulled back, which is gonna be pushing the shoulder blade kind of back towards us. It's a little bit awkward. I think we can work through it, right? So we're seeing this one roughly about here. Probably sitting like up around there somewhere. And then this one is being kind of compressed back up this way. You know, so the shoulder blades would kind of sit up in there a little bit. And then our anatomy kind of layers on top of that structure, right? So we've got spine and we've got shoulder blades. We've got kind of a nice cylindrical shape here to kind of show the structure of the torso. Now we can come in and kind of start to layer uh, the trapezius on top of there, right? And so first thing we're seeing Let's say some deltoid. Let's maybe get a little bit of deltoid on there first. All right, it's kind of coming out this way a little bit. Kind of down, maybe out, down. All right, and then it kind of cuts back in. Our deltoid, remember, attaches to the scapula. So if we figured out where our scapula sits, then we should be able to kind of just back up from the, that corner a little bit and say, okay, our deltoid's probably gonna attach right about there. And in this case, it's kind of dropping down this way, right? And then kind of cutting around this direction. And then also, you know, keep in mind that there's different heads. There's like three heads to the deltoid. And so we have to figure out kind of how to get those to read. And in this case, I think we're seeing two of them and maybe just a little bit of the third up above there. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. We'll probably get away with not doing that. Right, so we can kind of add our deltoid on, and then we can come in here and find how to add some of our trapezius, which is kind of like locking on here kind of in between the deltoid. All right, so in this case, it's kind of coming up over a little bit. <clears throat> right, and then sort of wrapping back down around this way. Right, we get the neck right up in here. That seven cervical vertebrae sort of poking out here. Also, I should have added a cylindrical shape for the neck. That would have been good.
or just kind of sitting up there. It's a little bit awkward. I'm going to not worry about this too much right now. I'll come back and work that out later. I don't want to stop and do that mid trapezius. Okay, so here it's coming over and connecting to the spine, right? So we're basically at this point just following that spine indication that I put on there earlier, right? Which is kind of coming around this way. And kind of cutting in a little bit. Right, and then we're going to attach Usually it kind of cuts part of the, the scapula off a little bit. And I'm not seeing this super clearly in the reference, but technically it should be doing this, at least a little bit. It kind of cuts over here, cuts down a little bit, and then we see it wrapping around this way. All right, and kind of making like a S-curve. I think that looks fine. A little bit of trapezius, and then on the other side, <clears throat> pick up the other side of the trapezius. Which, now, this one is stretched out, right? And so, <clears throat> that makes it, I wouldn't say easier, but I don't know. For me, it makes it a little bit easier. And we get this kind of like awkward little gap right in here. But on this side, his arm's pulled back towards us a bit. So we're getting a lot of compression happening. And so this trapezius, or this side of the trapezius, can be a little more awkward. Coming out, getting a little bit of deltoid out here. All right, kind of sitting right back in there. And what we're seeing, right, is same thing that's happening here, but really compressed. So this is kind of coming in, connecting to where the scapula is, all right, which remember was up about there. And then now it's all compressed, so it's just kind of doing this. And then we're picking up a little bit more of it, kind of coming down this way. You now it's looking like that. And then the spine, kind of running down this way. You know, our deltoid, remember, is attaching to the scapula. But in this case, we're just seeing like a little bit of it. So it kind of wraps around over there. And then keep going. Well, let's do this side first before we get into this side, because this side's all compressed and awkward. So there's like specific overlaps that occur here where we're going to have teres major and teres minor and then latissimus dorsi. Uh, teres <clears throat> major is attaching to the scapula, disappearing up this way, back behind the deltoid here. Right, and then we get Terry's major kind of cutting over this direction out from under here and going like underneath the scapula. Well, not underneath the scapula, sorry, underneath the tricep. Right, so it's kind of pressed up against here, popping out this way and back. Here. Okay. 
<coughs> David Rodriguez. Okay. Who asks, how many years it took Brian to get to this level of drawing anatomy? Many. Many years. I don't know if you guys can hear the question, but it was how many years did it take me to get to this level of, uh, you know, anatomical knowledge? And I don't know, like, I've been doing this for a long time, but I would say, you know, in terms of learning all the parts, <clears throat> didn't take too long, you know, because you just kind of study a little bit every day and eventually you get the parts. The hard part is learning to like design it and apply it in different poses and then to get to know it well enough that you can start to like kind of manipulate it and change it a bit as needed. That's harder. Uh, that takes a little while. I would say a few years worth of practice at least. And depending on how much time you're putting in, it could take a lot, you know? And that's a big part of it is how much time can you put into practice, you know? Is, are you, you know, can you spend hours a day, minutes? Like right now, I'm looking at this and realizing like ah, the way the tricep is kind of wedging up against the deltoid, not working quite right. I'm gonna try it again. And just kind of redo it. And I know our, they need to kind of press right up against each other. Pop right out that way, right? And so what's tricky here is we get the tricep inserting in between uh, teres major and teres minor and infraspinatus up here. Here's a question from Luis. Luis, welcome. the limits of the outer and inner sides of the scapula it seems a quite dynamic bone to recognize under lots of muscles and skin that's a good question uh so the question was like how, kind of how to recognize uh the limits of the scapula and you're right it's not super obvious so louise that's a good question uh the answer is there's landmarks we can see in the photo that kind of roughly show where it is. You know, like there's a line, like this part you can see pretty clearly. Because uh, you can kind of see where the, the trapezius kind of comes and wraps up around, around it right in here on the photo. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, I have the advantage of being able to zoom in on the photo as well. But you, if you look at the photo, you can see that pretty clearly. But the real answer is you just kind of have to draw a lot of scapulas and understand the anatomy really well. And like, I know what a good scapula shape looks like. And I know what it looks like when I look up at it a little bit from this angle, right? It's going to have a little bit of like a, an angle to it. And then in this case, his arms pulled out. So I know it's kind of dropping back this way. And then the bottom, I know the bottom kind of drops below the latissimus a little bit. So I can see kind of right where the lat sits. So I know the bottom of the scapula drops a little bit lower. From that point, the rest of it isn't that important. These three lines are important. The rest of the scapula, like up in here, this all gets covered by stuff, right? So we don't really, like it's important to know this like functionally and to understand how everything's connecting. But in terms of what I'm drawing right here, not that important, right? What's important is kind of like these three lines, right? This top one here, this one, and maybe the bottom one is good to know where it goes, even though it's covered by the lat. I would say those are all relatively important. And part of it is looking for landmarks, right? And, but to be honest, the landmarks aren't always clear, you know, and that's where practicing this stuff really comes in. And knowing what a good scapula shape looks like right and kind of like how it would sit roughly about like that and then practicing these shapes enough that you can kind of draw them as needed you know what i'm doing now is kind of like a hybrid like i'm not really copying the reference 
but I am using it to kind of figure out what's going on with the pose and, and the proportions and things. But I'm sort of designing the anatomy just through my own understanding of anatomy, you know, and I'm not really focused on copying the reference, but that's tough, right? To get to that point is really challenging. Like, cause like I was saying earlier, at first you have no choice but to copy the reference because you don't know enough not to, you have to copy it, you know? So like, uh, at first, I don't know, like when you first start learning this stuff, it's really frustrating because you'll hear, you know, take a class or something and you'll hear somebody like me tell you like, oh, you know, you want to it's get like to get a drawing that looks really dynamic. You actually have to invent a figure. But when you're first starting out, there's, it's not possible. You can't invent a figure, which means it's going to be a little while before you have really dynamic drawings is kind of what that's really saying. And uh you know, and then over time, as you get to know the anatomy better and the structure and how to work all that stuff, you'll get to the point where you can copy less and start to invent a little bit more. And then when you see someone draw, you know, like if you see like some really high level person draw from reference that does this amazing drawing, you'll get to the point where you start to realize like, oh, wait a minute, like they're not actually copying the reference they're just drawing a cool drawing that happens to be in that pose and had that likeness and must body type and things like that you know like what i'm drawing here isn't super clear in the reference but i do know that we have deltoid tricep infraspinatus terry's major maybe a little bit of terry's minor but to be honest i don't think that's showing up that you don't always see that in people because terry's major is pretty big and it'll kind of sit in here like this. You know, and these little overlaps in this area are super challenging to get right. Because we get infraspinatus going on top of the tricep. And then we get teres major going underneath the tricep. And then we have the latissimus going up underneath teres major. Right, so that gives us another overlap right here. You know, and then we have our trapezius coming around this way, and then we're not seeing this part, so I can erase that back out. But to answer the first question, which was how long does it take? It depends, right? Because how you learn like improves gradually. So like in terms of how long did it take me to just learn the anatomy? It probably took a couple of years, but also that's because I tended to work like in, in chunks where I would take a bunch of classes and work for a while and then kind of take a break and not work for a while. Like I wasn't super consistent. If I was, I think I would have uh, been able to work more quickly and learn more quickly. But it took me, yeah, probably a couple of years to really, really learn all the anatomy well, I would say. The lat, but the lat's probably really kind of running right through there. But the way he's twisted, we're seeing a lot of like kind of compression. The light's kind of picking stuff up in an interesting way. I guess my point was, had I studied more diligently, I think you can literally learn the anatomy much more quickly, like in a matter of months, even if you just really practice. But it's again, learning how to design it. That's really challenging. And uh, And that's partly what we'll be going over in the Bridgman class is talking more about how to design anatomy. Cause I teach a lot of anatomy classes and we talk about designing it, but Bridgman has like a very specific design sense, you know, and one that looks pretty cool and you can kind of learn to, to mimic it and implement it in your own drawings. 
in a way that looks pretty cool. Put the full comments and questions right here. Okay. <clears throat> so the first one is from Navad. Cool. Navad, welcome. Yeah, welcome. Who says, I bought myself a skull model and a head model for Christmas. Cool. It's so cool to have a physical reference that he can turn into different angles and light it. At oh, yeah, angles. definitely. And then he also said, big external oblique, also nice love handle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, okay, so then there's a question from Louise. Okay. Who said, how would you describe the box shape of the pelvis in that reference? I would see it as receding box, spatially speaking, although I don't clearly see the landmarks. Yeah, the box shape of the pelvis is tough on this one because it's turned completely to the side. Right, so what we're seeing for the box is really something like this. Like we're taking a box from the side, which in this case, I guess it would have a little bit of an angle to it, right? It would sit like this maybe. Right, like that, but then it's also, we're looking up at it, right? And so it's kind of like, turned this way a little bit so it's like this type of shape but then we're seeing a little bit of the bottom plane down here and then the question is well if his stomach and and like oblique weren't coming over here and blocking this part would we be seeing the other side of the box is it turned this way a little bit or is it just turned this way know we'd probably maybe see a little bit of it but to be honest it's a little bit of a judgment call like I don't know for sure that that's a hundred percent correct but I think we would see maybe a little bit of it yeah so we might get like that kind of shape on there for the box and plop right in there but notice that I didn't actually draw the box I usually do but in this case it's not real obvious, right? Like the, when I draw the box, it's usually for a very specific purpose. And it's to figure out like the, the rotation of the hips and how the oblique is attaching to it and how the legs attach to the box. In this case, you know, it's basically just sitting like in here, kind of doing this, you know, and it's not like super obvious. Or I guess it's obvious, but it's not like super helpful in terms of like the overall construction. So I just kind of skipped it, you know. But I think it would be about like this. And we would be seeing, so we'd be seeing it from the side, and then we'd see a little bit of the bottom of the box. I don't know, like that maybe? It'd be a tough box. But again, from this angle, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Like conceptually, it's good to understand that we're seeing it from the side and it's rotated this way, right? And you can tell because we're seeing this other far glute. And from this angle to see that, you would have to rotate the box, right? We'd have to be looking up at it. So that's important to know. But in terms of drawing it, I don't know that we need to draw it necessarily from this angle. Okay, let's get a little bit of this arm on here. I'm gonna pull the arm in a little bit. I think it moved out a little bit far during the gesture phase. And also, there's a little bit of um, What's that muscle called in the back? Big one sits like in here and it goes like all the way up and splits off into a bunch of different parts. I'm drawing a blank. It is, I don't know, I'll remember in a minute. But it's sitting right in here, essentially. It's kind of like right in here where we're picking up some of the muscle. 
kind of like right in there. We can see it like here. And then we're seeing like some ribs in here a little bit. You know, a few like rib type things. And then the meaty part of the latissimus is kind of like over here. The lat is mostly like a big thin sheet, you know, of like a mix of tendon and muscle and stuff. And the, the thicker parts of the lat that get meaty and do all the work are like along the edge here and sometimes across the top here is kind of where it gets thicker. And uh, I don't know, just, just so you know. Okay, so we're going to have a little bit of the bicep. Turns into tendon, right down around there, right? We get tricep again, which popping out this way, All right? Kind of cuts in a little bit and then down to the elbow, kind of right back down in there and then our elbow kind of adjust the gesture here a little bit pull that in it's partly why we want to keep the our marks as like our mark making in general as simple as possible right and stick with c curves s curves and straights and then use them in a way where we're not making excessive marks and we want to keep things really simple because we want them to be very changeable you know and it's really easy to i don't know get caught up in detail too early and then when you realize something's not right you know like i just shifted this whole arm over like this half the arm i just moved it in but if i had gone in there and drawn something really detailed initially your tendency is to not want to change it you know, instead you'll end up kind of looking at it and uh, kind of focusing more on the things around it, I guess. Because, like, if you spend a lot of time working on something, you don't want to change it. Like, it's just, I don't know if it's human nature or what, but you'll, you'll tend to want to change the things around it rather than the thing that actually needs to be changed because you spent so much time on it, you know. And so for that reason... We want to keep things as simple as possible in the gesture phase. Again, that doesn't look quite right. I think our elbow needs to move up just a little bit. This needs to be a little more subtle. And then the hand it's going away from us. We're only seeing like the heel, heel, I don't know, the back part of the palm, whatever you would call it, of the hand, and then a little bit of it just wrapping around the chair. So it's kind of an awkward hand position. So just kind of like seeing a tiny bit of it right there. And of course we have some tricep. happening and we have the different heads of the triceps so we've got the uh what is it long head short head no long head medial head i don't know i teach so many anatomy classes you think i would know this i haven't picked up a pencil i've been doing christmas stuff lately it's been a little while probably not what you want to hear your anatomy teacher say but there's basically three heads to the tricep, right? So we've got the long one that goes all the way and connects all the way up here. And then the short head, I, don't know, I call it the shorter one. Maybe it's a lateral one, whatever you want to call it. The one on the outside, which I don't think we're seeing from this angle. And then the medial one sitting underneath those two, which is kind of pop it out right there a little bit. Like 
that. And we get a little bit of bone maybe, right? And we can see a little bit of the head of the humerus in here. Right, sitting right about there. All right, so we get that long head and then the medial head underneath, maybe a little bit of bone sticking out. And then our bicep and maybe a little bit of brachialis or something right in here. And then you're seeing this kind of interesting shape right in here, which I think is part of the pronator, right? We have a muscle kind of like up in here. I'm, I'm I, obviously I don't spend a lot of time in the gym, uh, so I'm not the best example, but you can see at the outside of the elbow, if you can see it here, there's like a muscle that wraps across this way, which is the pronator. And I think that's what we're seeing right there, kind of wrapping across here. You know, we get some of that pronator in there. And then, of course, our flexors and stuff. I don't want to go too much into forearms. Forearms get really complicated. Did you see the last couple of top ribs? No. Okay. I see any. So, there are a couple more. So, Luis asked if you were talking about the latissimus dorsi. Uh, latissimus dorsi, uh, I don't know, that was a while ago. I'm not oh, sure what that was in reference to. Oh, oh, what was uh, that? I forgot, there was something I just forgot the name of. I think I remembered it though. I don't know. <laughs> you got the little charcoal. Where, here? Yeah, you got it. Oh, okay. I don't know if you can even see it on camera. I don't know. This is like a little bit of My apologies if I'm covered in charcoal. <laughs> Bad time to scratch my nose, apparently. Okay, anyway. Cool. Yeah. Oh, Louis said that, yeah, that is the one. Oh, so good. Latissimus dorsi. Could be dorsi. I don't know. Honestly, I don't actually know how to pronounce these names. Hey, I just make them up. <laughs> I, yeah. Latin, I yeah, I didn't go to medical school, just uh, as a disclaimer. And I don't know how to speak Latin, so. These names could be mispronounced. Oh, yeah? So, yeah, so Dang. that's why I'm late on the comments. I'm okay. I keep up with them, but I didn't Yeah, want to Olivia, be Olivia's sick. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think anyone wants to listen to sniffles and sneezing, so. I don't know. I'm making them listen to me drink this delicious <laughs> Coca Cola. <laughs> Drinking song? Okay. Yeah. Well, see ya. I'll okay. Read comments from the other room. Okay. Goodbye. I'll come back in a bit. That's cool. Anyway, this is basically it. But again, challenging areas, right? In these areas with the scapula, the uh, latissimus, infraspinatus, teres major, uh, deltoid, trapezius. Knowing that stuff is super helpful. And what people always ask is like, do you have to know anatomy to draw well? And the answer is no. You actually don't. You can actually get away without, with not knowing this stuff. Uh, but it depends on what level you want to work at, right? Like if you're going to be, I don't know, a comic book artist, and you're going to have more, I don't know, it's, it's helpful, I guess I would say. And the if, depending on the look you want in your drawings, you probably need to know more or less anatomy. Um, I know it pretty well because I like to teach it and I find it interesting and uh, but in my opinion knowing more anatomy will only make your drawings better.
Gonna get some flexors down here. But do you have to learn all of it, like literally every muscle? No, there's like key things that you need to know, right? Areas like this and the way the overlaps work are super, super helpful, you know? And knowing like the big muscle groups, I would say is incredibly helpful. <clears throat> and uh, knowing, yeah, I don't know. It helps you know where overlaps should go, right? And understand how all these little overlaps work. Because overlap, overlap, sorry, I can't talk, uh, is one of the main things that adds depth to a drawing, right? So if you don't get your overlaps correct, then your drawing is not going to look right. And the overlaps, for the most part, are guided by two things, right? One is the underlying basic shapes, right, which we did initially. We found those big boxes and cylinders and that kind of thing. And then there's also the, uh, the anatomy, right? And those combined kind of create each of these little overlaps, right? Like this line is being overlapped by this one. This one is overlapping this one. This one is overlapping this one. This one's overlapping that one. Each little overlap creates depth, you know? And obviously we want depth in our drawing. I mean, that's important. And so learning how to utilize those things and make them look more three-dimensional and more, I don't know, just interesting, how to design them in interesting ways is very helpful. Oh, I remember which muscle I was trying to think of. It's this big one. But actually, it's not latissimus dorsi. It's underneath latissimus dorsi is the one I was trying to think of. And it is, I'm going to remember right now, erector spinae. There you go. Uh, it's basically, it's underneath the latissimus. It's like a deeper muscle that sits kind of like right in here. And then if you look it up, you'll see it actually branches off into a bunch of different things. It kind of goes all the way up to the spine way up here, branches out and connects out across here. It does a bunch of different things, but it all kind of comes back into a big muscle that sits right about in here, which is erector spinae. That's what I was trying to remember earlier. So that is the answer to your question, or the answer to my question, I guess. Um, yeah, and you can see that on him a little bit, like right in here, there's like, you see rib in here, and then there's like, kind of like a lump right in there. And that's that erector spinae muscle. Same thing here, right? We're getting all this compression and that is a little bit of latissimus and a little bit of erector spinae all kind of getting compressed together on that side. And let's see if we can find more of the back of the head here. I've only seen a little bit of it. And then his ear is sitting at like this kind of an angle. And it's not very big, it's pretty small. Sitting right about there. And what's tough is the shape that I put down kind of includes some of his hair. But then his hair on the side of his head is cut really short. Really short hair like that is always challenging to draw. I don't know, his head's up around there somewhere. So we could draw some of the chair. There's, there's a couple things we could do right now, depending on, I guess, what I'm in the mood for. 
which is uh, we can either draw the chair, which is important, right? Because honestly, drawing floating figures like this is a really bad habit of mine that I have uh, been working to overcome over the years. So we could draw the chair so he's not floating because floating figures are not great. Or we could put some shadow pattern on here. Maybe we could do both. I don't know. Let's get just at least a little bit of chair indication because it's a little bit awkward right now. And maybe pull this up a little bit. So the chair, let's see here, we're kind of looking like the, the seat part of the chair, we're kind of looking right at it. It's pretty flat. We're seeing a little bit of the corners stick out here. Might even be looking up at it just slightly. And then we're seeing the other part kind of stick out here just a little bit. So notice what I'm doing is I'm drawing through the form. So we need to make sure this all aligns properly. Leg of the chair comes from about here. All right, it's gonna kind of sit down here. Not bad. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> First, Luis said that you have more medical anatomy knowledge than any first-year medical student. Yeah. <laughs> doctors. Yeah. I would have That's to cool. Agree. I appreciate that. I will say I know a lot of anatomy, but I only know like the surface anatomy. So, if you need me to draw organs, I would be in trouble. I don't. <laughs> I don't know that stuff. Well, I could probably figure it out pretty quick. He does also say that you know, or he says, I know no anatomy professor that can handle anatomy at this high level of proficiency. I have That's to pretty cool. Also. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, let's see. Stefano is just mentioning some pages of Bridgman that has some nice drawings of the deep back muscles that you mentioned. Oh, nice. Yeah, so thanks for that, so the other students can kind of look. That's cool, and I'll use that too, because I'm teaching a Bridgman class next term, and the way I think I'm going to do it is I'm going to go in and just, like, take photos or scan pages from the Bridgman book and give those out as reference. So, yeah, that's what people are going to get. Not entirely sure how to run it yet. question for you. This okay. is from Ryden Williams. Oh, Ryden. He says, hey Brian, I tried to learn the torso anatomy recently and got so burnt out. I tried to draw every muscle over a skeleton with tracing paper. Is there a better way to do it? What have you seen work? Um, I mean, that's kind of the way I run my classes is like we kind of start with the skeleton and layer stuff on top of it but i only do that in the first week you know and so yeah it's it's a tough it's a tough first week for a torso class right because we go over literally all the torso anatomy on week one but the reason we do that is because it, it gets people familiar with what's there and it's not like you have to master it right away you know you don't have to literally memorize all of it you just need to get a feel for like kind of where things are, where they're connecting. And then the next four weeks of the class, uh, we don't really do that anymore. You know, I don't know if you've been in my anatomy classes or not, but from there we kind of switch over to um, focusing more on basic shapes and design of the anatomy and how to kind of apply it in more like a practical way. Uh, so I would say focusing on that is better, but then the question is, well, how do you do that? 
Uh, I would say master studies, right? Like Bridgman is good, but it's kind of sloppy. To, no offense to Bridgman, but you know, I think from what I understand, at least he was drawing really big, right? Like on huge pieces of butcher paper, and he had like a three foot stick with a piece of chalk on the end of it, and he was drawing so, so like a big auditorium of people could see what he was doing. And it's a tough way to draw. I mean, that's that would be hard for me for sure. Uh, so that's why his drawings look kind of weird and sloppy. So I would say take those Bridgman drawings and see if you can clean them up a little bit, but that's kind of hard at first. I'm trying to think of a better example. I guess what I'm getting at is master studies would be kind of the key and focusing on how they're designing anatomy and applying it. And then that'll give you a chance to like kind of see anatomy in action a little bit, you know, cause just memorizing the pieces and drawing it on a skeleton, that's good, but it's not going to help you do like a figure drawing really, you know, like it's, that's really just to teach you what's there and where things attach, which is just step one, you know? So like, I wouldn't spend too much time doing that. Like, I think if you work through that once, <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> sorry, what I tell my students is on that first week when we do that, what you're really doing is creating a guide for yourself that you can refer back to at later times. You're basically creating your own anatomy book. So you only need to work through that once, you know, and then once you kind of get that stuff down, then you can kind of like just go more into figure drawing and then refer back to those drawings and say like, wait a minute, I'm having trouble in this area. In fact, this is kind of what I would recommend, right? Is say you're drawing an arm or a leg or whatever, and you're having a hard time with it. I would get out a book like the Goldfinger book, which I think I have around here somewhere, which looks oh, like this. this. One. Yeah, this one, right? This is the, the Goldfinger, Elliot Goldfinger, right? Human Anatomy for Artists. This is like a textbook, right? This is more like a medical textbook. I mean, it says it's for artists, but if you look at it, right? Like it's all laid out like textbook style almost. It's really clear. It's like the exact opposite of the Bridgman book, right? And so this, like I would frequently be saying like, okay, well, I'm drawing this arm, but this is really hard. I'm not sure what's going on in this area. So you can take this book out, look up the arm, look at what's going on in this area, and it makes it very, very clear, right? Like there's no mistaking what's going on in this book. The problem is everything's just kind of flat and boring and like, you don't actually want to draw like this. I mean, no offense to, to Goldfinger, but like if I was doing a figure drawing, I wouldn't want it to look like this, you know? But if you're trying to learn anatomy, this is how you need to, to see it, right? So then once I look at this, I would also go look at the Bridgman book, which I think I have here as well. And then I would go look at like, say that same part in the Bridgman book, which would be, I don't know, somewhere on the leg back of the leg. Let's see if I can find a comparison shot here. Oh yeah, here's the same back of the leg, right? So in the Goldfinger book, on the screen, yeah. Right, we've basically got like the medical version almost where everything's super, super clear. Here we have the Bridgman version where things are a little sloppy, but they're designed in a really cool way. And yeah, like, will a real human leg look like this? Eh, not quite. It's going to look more like this one. But as a drawing, this works really well. And this feels kind of like stiff. You know, so uh, that's part of what we're going to be doing in the Bridgman class is, is kind of focusing more on a little bit of the combination of these two books and then how to take things like, you know, stuff like these, you know, this like back of the knee type drawing and figure out how do we interpret that and use it in a way that that is useful, right? And less sloppy. So we'll kind of be cleaning this up and figuring out like exactly what's going on here and why he's drawing it the way that it is, you know, and figuring out like, what the heck is this? Like the first time I looked at this book before studying anatomy for a long time, like this was confusing as heck. And yet at the same time, I recognize that it's designed in a really visually interesting way. You know, it's got both. And so that's kind of what we'll be focused on. So that's what I would recommend for learning anatomy is kind of the combination of the two, you know, and you can work through 
I don't know about just copying the Bridgman drawings. I mean, we'll be doing some of that for the first few weeks of the class, but the last two weeks, we're gonna just be doing figure drawings, right? And we're just gonna be working from photo reference of a, fi of a person and, and then doing just what I was talking about, where we'll look and say, okay, here's an arm and it's in this position and we'll find something kind of similar in the Bridgman book and then design our arm with some of that Bridgman design sense to kind of figure out how to take that Bridgman anatomy knowledge and apply it. I don't know. I don't know if this answers your question or not, to be honest. It's a little, it's confusing. Anatomy is a tough thing. And it's something that like, say you want to be a concept artist or like a, I don't know, comic book artist, I don't know, whatever. Do you literally have to know every single piece of anatomy and how to design it perfectly? No, not really, but you need to know the main parts and, and how they function in order for things just to look right, you know, and to get the overlaps correct. And so studying some anatomy is gonna be really helpful, but you don't have to know it quite to the level that I know it because I, I teach anatomy stuff. So I gotta know all the names. That's another thing people ask me all the time is like, do we have to learn the names? Honestly, no, you don't have to. You can get away with not knowing the, the names. To me, it's a little bit easier knowing the names because it's sort of like, I don't know, I have an easier time remembering them, I guess, when I know the name. But that's just me. Like, you don't have to know the name. What's important is understanding uh, the origin and insertion, right? Where it starts and where it stops and then how it's overlapping and inter interacting with the stuff around it is the important part, you know, because each one of these little overlaps is, is critical. Okay, I got distracted and didn't draw all of the chair. Put a little bit more chair on here. I don't know. That's enough chair for now, I think. Brandon says, thank you so much. That helps a ton. Good. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, oh, and also Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. And then E.A. Humdinger. Humdinger, says, yeah. David Beverly Hales. Is that oh, yeah. David, the Beverly Hale book is good. I don't think I have it, actually. I was going to say, I was like, do you have that one? I don't think I do, but I've seen it before. And I know, like, when I was teaching at Watts for a long time, people would bring it in. Occasionally, I'd look at it. And it's pretty good. It has, like, that same kind of design sense to it, if I'm thinking of the right thing. I'm going to look it up real quick. Beverly Hale. Yeah, here we go. Images. Yeah, see, he, he has a similar, like, kind of three-dimensional design sense. Sorry, I know you guys can't see what I'm looking at right now, but it's cool. You can look it up. So yeah, I, Beverly Hale is a good option. There's a few guys. There's um, a German name that's pretty good. Durr, Albrecht Durr or something. There's a few guys. It's not like Bridgman's the only option. I mean, there's a few guys in the past that did a lot of like anatomy teaching type work and uh, were pretty good. And then there's a lot of modern guys, too. It's not like I'm the only good person out here teaching anatomy right now. I'm trying to find a good example, but Google's not pulling up anything worth showing on screen right now. Let's look up Albrecht Durer. Oh, 
I didn't think I'm the wrong guy. I swear that's the right name. Does he have a drawing book? Artwork, hair, artist, sketch. I don't know. Anyway, I'm not going to make you guys watch me look at Google. That seems like a terrible way to do a live stream. But yeah, there's there's good people out there for sure. And plenty of good reference and people you can study for design purposes. But master studies are the type of thing I would recommend for that. You know, what's tough about master studies when you first start you kind of don't get that much out of them. You do, but it's not the stuff you want to get out of it, right? Like when you, you hear about master studies, you hear usually people say like, oh, you learn to design stuff and you learn about like all this cool, cool stuff. But then after a while you realize like, wait a minute, I did the master study and I didn't learn that much cool stuff. And what's interesting is at first you kind of don't which is a little weird, but like it takes a while to develop like just a hand-eye coordination to get things in the right spot. So when you're first starting out, when you do a master study, you're gonna be more focused on replicating the proportions, replicating like the line work and, and things that, you know, you need to know before you can get into like design and things like that, like the higher level stuff. You know, and then as you improve, you, you'll do the same master study a few years later and get totally different stuff out of it, which is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, sorry, I got distracted. I'm having a hard time with this chair. So if you've done a master study and you thought, man, what the heck, I, that didn't seem to help me much at all. It probably did help, but just not in the ways that you wanted it to. And uh, I would recommend keep doing them. And then every few years, try and revisit some of those same master studies. And I think you'll re suddenly realize like, oh, wait a minute. I actually got quite a bit out of this and it's different stuff than I did the first time. You know, and then as you improve, over time, it'll just keep getting better and better. And then you'll reach a point where you can focus more on design and, and things like that. Another question here for you. Okay. This is from Luis who asks, how about Godfrey Bombs or bands? Yes, that's who I was thinking of. When I said Albrecht Durer, that's actually who I was thinking of. I knew it was like a German type name. I think that's, hang on, let me check before I. Uh, Gott Freak, man, I don't know how to spell his name. Gott Freak. Bombs? How do you spell bombs? He wrote B A M M E S. Oh. And then he also mentioned Valerie Winslow. Is that maybe a Valkyrie? Winslow, I don't know. Bombs is the guy I was thinking of when I said Durer. Durer, I have studied in the past, but more for his little, like, portrait sketches. He has some really cool little portrait sketches. Um, but Bombs was the guy I was thinking of for designing anatomy. Yeah, he's pretty good, too. I think he's German. I could be wrong. Maybe it's just Durer. Yeah, this is the stuff I expected to see. These are cool. And then it's just a matter of which one you like more, right? Like, do you relate to these drawings more or to, you know, Bridgman or, you know, Frazetta? I don't know, whoever you like. Is who you should copy, right? Because who you study is who's going to have a big influence on your work. So if you look at someone like you know, bombs or, or Bridgman or something, and you're like, man, I don't like this at all. I don't want to draw like this. Don't study it. That would be my recommendation. You know, because the things you study are the things that are going to influence how your drawings look. So 
So just be careful. I'll pull this side in just a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Okay, I think that's enough share. Let's do a little bit of a shadow pattern just to get it on there. Just kind of clean up the chair. Notice like when I drew that chair, I just drew right through that leg as though it wasn't there, right? Because I got to make sure the whole thing works together. If you just try and draw this little part of the chair and this little part of the chair and you try and get them working perfectly, it's not going to work quite right. So like you just got to draw through the form and just draw as though that leg's out there and then just erase the rest of it, you know, back out. You should hopefully end up with something kind of cool. Obviously, there's a lot more like leg anatomy and stuff we could put in. But to be honest, it's a little less prominent than this stuff up here because he's kind of like twisting and flexing all of this stuff. The leg, it's mostly relaxed. You're picking up some anatomy stuff in here, and there's always some in the knee, but for the most part, it's not like super anatomical. Okay, so let's do a little bit of shadow pattern real quick. Let's go in here and just find... Oh, first thing I'm gonna do is lighten it a little bit. Although I do pretty dark. I tend to draw dark for like demo purposes so people can actually see what I'm doing. But uh, if this were like my own drawing that I was doing is like a longer type drawing, I wouldn't draw this dark. At least not during the construction phase, just so you know. So here we're picking up a little bit of shadow that's showing the split between these two heads of the deltoid here right and we're picking up pretty soft edges right because right here it's a very rounded form right so when we're doing shadow pattern or just edges in general like there's different ways to work the whole shadow mapping thing is really more of a training tool and uh, it's not not something you have to do once you kind of understand how form works and how shadows work and edges, how edges work. But in terms of learning about edges, I would say it's, it's pretty helpful. It's worth, worth doing a little bit of shadow mapping, right? So if we have a more rounded form, then a form shadow is going to have a pretty soft edge. And if we have a more angular type form, then it's going to have more of a, uh, like a harder type edge. Or in this case, as this rounds around this way, we hit the end of the form, you know, and then it kind of connects into this next form. So we'll have kind of a harder edge underneath here. And then I'll get a little bit of a cast shadow, I think, across here. Right, and then we pick up again another form shadow right here on Terry's major. Right, and then that seeing a little bit of the latissimus kind of pop up under here. And then we get again a little bit of shadow kind of popping out this way. Kind of cuts back a little bit, and then we pick up a big shadow across the latissimus right here. Which I'm going to have kind of like a little bit harder edge, not hard, but harder and then softer. Kind of back across here, maybe. Partly just to have more variation to it, right? We, anytime we have a long edge like this, we got to have some variation to it. 
So having too much of the same thing is a little bit boring. We don't want that. Of course, we're picking up a harder edge across here. All right, a little bit like that. That's coming down and connecting into our shadow across kind of the oblique leading down into like the inguinal ligament. Kind of running right across here. It's kind of rolls into shadow there. And of course, a harder edge underneath here where it's kind of like tucking up under that part of the oblique. Right, because we get that like kind of iliac crest from the, the pelvis kind of tucking up underneath there. Right, and so notice I'm using kind of like harder, straighter lines. Kind of design it out. Um, give me some questions to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there's one from Luis okay. who asks, what would you personally recommend as a primary source to get knowledge from? What would I recommend as a primary source for knowledge? I would recommend me. <laughs> I am the primary source. No, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's like, in terms of one source for knowledge, I don't know if there's just one source. You know, like when I think about all the stuff I've learned over the years, yeah, I learned a lot at Watts because I was a student at Watts for a long time and then I taught there for a long time. But part of what they teach at Watts is learning how to go find all these other sources, you know, and part of that is through master studies and studying guys like Bridgman and uh, Frazetta and like all those like golden age illustrators, you know, like Leindecker and Rockwell and... Uh, yeah, there's not one source. There's what's important is more like the quality of the source, you know, and making sure that you're studying things that are actually really helpful. And uh, there's a lot of bad information out there, unfortunately. And that's what makes things tough is, well, then how do you know if you have a good source? You know, and that's where a place like Watts comes in handy, because then, you know, like as a student, I knew those guys were really good. And so if they tell me a source is good and, and if they are good at what they do and they have good information, then I believe them, you know, because they were really good. And so, yeah, so I don't know. That's partly what I try to teach as well is like, how do you find all these different like sources of information? And then what do you do with them? You know, like it's one thing to be like, oh, study Leindecker or study Bridgman. You know, but like, what do you actually do with it to study it? You know, yeah, master studies are important. Kind of going off screen there. But then how do you do a master study? How do you, you know, what is it that you're trying to learn from a master study? It's all like kind of different, different stuff that kind of changes depending on your skill level and depending on what it is you're trying to learn you know like if i want to learn about anatomy and design i would probably look at different artists than if i was trying to learn about like color or i don't know something else you know it just kind of depends but definitely i would say there's not just one source you know Although I would like to know everything, but it's not possible. So we've got a little bit of shadow cutting across the chair.
But I can tell you what I consider to be good sources. And, uh, but again, it depends on what it is you're trying to learn, you know? It's looking pretty good. So if we filled all that in, I think it would look decent, you know? So we've got shadow here, shadow up under here, here, all the way back up around there. You know, we can add some over here, which is going to be a little bit challenging. Definitely some shadow. Up under here, and then it's kind of wrapping back up under, I'm just realizing I kind of missed an overlap right in here. Right where all that compression is occurring. You know, and then we kind of pick up some shadow here on the bottom part of the trapezius. I would say a little bit of shadow on the bottom part of this trapezius as well. I'll add just a little bit. Just to show that they're both you know, three-dimensional forms that are sort of like wrapping around there at the end where they stop. And then depending on what we want to do, right? So we're definitely picking up a little bit more shadow. There's like a little chunk of shadow right in here. You know, where we're picking up some stuff and then we could try to add a little bit right in here at the bottom of Erector Spinae, but it's tough right in that area. Like you could argue maybe that's more of a dark half tone and not really a shadow. Or you could say it's a really light shadow. I would say it's probably technically more of a light half tone. I'm going to map it a little bit just real quick because it's a very distinct shape. design that stuff out and then we get a little bit of like little bits of shadow along the spine which again I would I would say aren't really shadows so much as dark half tones at least in terms of value but they do again make very distinct shapes which could be helpful to have in there just at least a little bit just to show that we've got some spine stuff happening Even if it's not like perfectly designed. Just get a few little vertebrae sticking out there. And then we just have to kind of make like a mental note that this stuff isn't going to be as dark as our shadow values. It'll be a little bit more like a dark half tone. But what's interesting is the halftones work the same way as the shadows. They're just in a lighter part of the value scale. You know, and then we have a cast shadow cutting across here. Just kind of merging with our form shadow on the tricep and across this way. Now there's all sorts of like striations in the tricep here. I don't know that I would put that in right this second. I think I would just map this as a rounded form and then later if I were to get into like rendering then I would probably add it back in. I'm 
another question here. Yeah. This is from Raiden also. Okay, Raiden. Next question. Says, do you use your drawing knowledge to paint or do you usually draw? I'm sticking to drawing for now, but I want to be able to paint at some point. That is a good question. Question, if you guys couldn't hear it, was do I use my drawing knowledge to paint or do I just stick with drawing? Uh, I did, uh, I used it to paint for a long time. And ultimately, I don't know, to be honest, I didn't really like painting all that much. And so I kind of stopped and just focused on drawing. But I got decent at it, right? It's not like I was like terrible at it or anything. It just wasn't what I wanted to do, really. And so eventually I stopped. But what I learned pretty early on was that uh, the drawing knowledge is super important for the painting. Right, like if you don't understand how this stuff works, it's gonna make painting way, way more difficult. Right, because painting, like what we're dealing with here is essentially, uh, you know, all the construction stuff, like our gesture and structure. <clears throat> and then on top of that, we have shape, value, and edge. If we were gonna work it up into like a full, full value rendered drawing, right? We've got shape, we've got value, and we've got edge. When you get into painting, all of that stuff still applies. You have to do all of that perfectly, and then you add even more variables on top of it, right? Which are like color, saturation, and uh, temperature, right? So now suddenly, rather than three variables, suddenly you have six variables, and it becomes way more complicated, like considerably more complicated, right? So if you take the time to learn this stuff in drawing, then when you go to paint, you won't have to think about these three variables, right? Like all these variables. And that'll bring you down to the point where you can focus on color and temperature and saturation and like how to mix colors, color theory. Um, but I can tell you right now that if you don't understand construction and value and edges and things like that, when you go to paint, it will be insanely more difficult than that it would be had you taken the time to kind of like, you know, study some of this stuff in drawing form first. So that would be my recommendation. Also, as a recommendation, I would say don't wait too long to paint. Like, it's tempting to be like, well, I need to master all the drawing stuff first. And that probably technically would be the right way to do it, but it would also be the long way to do it. And it would take a long time. And I don't know that it would be, uh, I don't know. Like if you have a lot of time on your hands, I guess, and you don't mind it taking a long time to figure this stuff out, then that's fine. Most people don't have that much time. And so you're gonna have to do a little bit of both at once. You know. So if you wanna paint, I would say, yeah, definitely spend some time studying drawing. And then after you start kind of getting some of the basics down and you're getting decent with proportion and you're getting decent with value and edges and stuff, even if you're not like at like the absolute top level, I would start looking into painting and studying painting at that point. And then also drawing, like don't stop drawing because you still need to keep learning that stuff as well. But you don't want to wait too long to paint either but that's i don't know that was what i got from it at least painting is fun i don't know it just i had a i had a really hard time learning to paint like my brain is geared more towards like the technical construction type stuff it took me a long time to get painting figured out. It was not easy for me. So we got a nice soft edge right around here. Along the glute. Gluteus maximus. Soften that up. 
Yeah, but I will say what I learned about painting real fast is that if you are trying to learn, like essentially when you, if you, you don't learn the drawing stuff first, when you go to paint, what you end up having to do is learn all the drawing stuff through painting. And it's really hard because essentially you won't do a good painting for a long, long time until you start understanding proportion and structure and edges and all that stuff. And then they'll start to come together and it, it's not an easy way to learn to paint. It's not, uh, not what I would recommend. And to be honest, that's partly what this style of drawing is for, right? Like this is kind of what I learned at Watts and what they teach there is actually a way of training, training painters, right? Like Watts isn't really set up to train. I mean, it is, but it, like that style of drawing that they do specifically is, is meant to help train painters, right? And that's why they're working tonally and they're working with shape, value and edge. Like it's all things that apply directly to painting. So then when you go to paint, it, it's way, way easier. And you can just focus on color and value, or color and uh, temperature, saturation, stuff like that. So hopefully that makes sense. So I think your plan of drawing first is a good one, I guess. But just don't feel like you have to literally master every single part of drawing before you go start to paint. You know, you just need to get get the basics down and uh, you know, get them up to a reasonable level. Right now we've got a whole bunch of compression in his leg right here because it's pressed up against his foot and it's pushing the hamstring up and it's creating this big crease between the vastus lateralis and uh, biceps femoris. So we're gonna have to figure out kind of where that would sit, right? So we know the lateralis is like here. So that shadow and then what makes that complicated, because it looks like a complicated shape, it, the reason for that is because then the IT band is running right along there as well. And so we're kind of creating like a really complex form right in here. Where we're kind of seeing like the bottom of the lateralis and then also the IT band. Right, so something kind of like that. And then we have this little harder edge underneath here. Where we're getting the, the bottom of the lateralis pressed up against the biceps femoris. And it's kind of merging back into this shadow. You could probably argue that this little bit in here is more like a dark half tone. I think it is, but at least shape-wise, I'm going to link it back into here. That's pretty cool.
that's kind of a good example of like, I'm not copying necessarily, but I understand the anatomy of that's there and kind of like how to design it, you know? And so it kind of works, even though it's not like an exact replica of what we're seeing in the reference. But again, keep in mind, if you're newer, that's not really gonna be possible. You know, you'll try and do that and it's just gonna be really frustrating. It's more like a, an advanced type thing. At first, you have to copy, you know, like there's no, no other option really at first until you start really kind of learning how some of this stuff works. So we have this interesting little split right up in here, right? And you can see that vastus lateralis, that muscle on the side, is actually ending about here, right? And kind of cutting across here. And it's actually going way up here. It's actually pretty big. And so we're seeing some erectus femoris, lateralis. Lateralis is kind of ending here. And then this is actually some of the femur, right? Like the head of the femur right in here. And then this thing out here is vastus medialis on the other side, kind of poking out and wrapping around. Until we hit more femur out here. Of course, we hit that kind of big boxy shape of the knee, which, you know, if you look at it, like there's some, intricate stuff going on there which I'm just gonna actually kind of ignore right now and just make the big boxy shape first right remember I was saying that we have the head of the fibula right about in here so that's picking up some shadow about in there and then we'll have a little bit of yeah this is a complex area I mean we're getting some of the peroneus maybe some soleus and some of the fibula right head of the fibula right here is that what I said a second ago or did I say femur I don't know that's the head of the fibula all these names man they get confusing Right, and then I'm guessing this is part of the peroneus where we pick up a little bit of muscle right in here on the side of the leg. And then we're probably picking up some more of the actual tibia or maybe fibula, I don't know, one or the other, but it's basically doing this. Picking up some bone, that's important part. So I'm going to make this part a little bit wider. All right, we get some of the ankle in here. Some of the ankle bone, pick up a little bit of shadow. Right back in there. And the rest of the foot, I mean, again, there's a bunch of complicated stuff. I mean, there's veins, there's bones, there's all this stuff. Right now, I would focus just on like the big big form big big form first and then we can go back in and add more details later which i'm probably not going to be doing on this live stream because we're pretty much out of time
I'm gonna get into drawing toes too much right now. Again, just mostly sticking with big shapes. Yeah, Luis. He said, kind of an off-topic message, but looking forward to your landscape classes. It would be nice to see how you approach it. Do you plan on doing landscape? I don't know about landscape. I would like to get someone to teach some landscape classes, but I don't know if it'll be me. But I do want to teach some like intro level composition classes. I would like to do that. I think that would be cool. But I don't do a lot of landscape stuff. I probably should. But I don't. I can't do everything. I kind of like decided at a certain point to kind of like specialize in figure type stuff. So that's kind of what I do. So in terms of the school, like, obviously, we need, probably need some landscape stuff. We need some composition stuff. We need a little bit of everything. You know, so we're going to be looking for more instructors soon. So if you know anybody that wants to teach a class that's really good at landscape, be willing to check them out. Another comment from Raiden, who says, thanks for the live stream today. I heard the surf is insane right now in Cali. Oh, yeah. yeah it went it crazy is. for a while. <laughs> yeah, the surf really went went nuts there for days, a week. I don't we know. It lasted hear a while. It from our yeah. House. Yeah. We could hear it from our house, I which sometimes we can house. hear it. I'm surprised. But, like, we could hear it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, we went and looked at it a few times. It was crazy. The The waves were gigantic there for a while. I guess, I don't know. I th think I read that it was because of some storm that was like offshore, I think. But I don't know. I'm not a wave expert. Unless you want to draw a wave, then I could probably do that. Yeah, the waves were gigantic. Like, they were. They feet. Yeah, they got really big. Oh, here, let's put this shadow on here. Picking up a little bit of shadow on the epicondyle of the humerus here. Do you know the time? Yo, oh, yeah, I guess you have the time over there, right in the corner? Right I mean, at the clock. Oh, okay. Gotcha. No, the sumo is not recording. It doesn't okay. tell me the time, but I can see that it's almost 9 o'clock. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just going to finish up this last little part. And then we will be done. No rush. I just haven't been telling you the time, so I wasn't sure if you had it. No, yeah, I've just been drawing. I do want to get this little bit of shadow on here. And then on the leg, and then that'll be it. Yeah, if you like to surf, then there was big waves. I don't surf. Also, it probably would have been dangerous to surf in those waves. They were really big. They were like 15 feet. They were huge. But I will say, when we went out there and looked at them, <clears throat> there were a couple people out there surfing. Try and do at least. Raiden, I think you're in Hawaii, if I remember properly. I would imagine you have seen some big waves.
Yeah, I will say there's going to be some big changes to the school over the next few months. And one of those things is going to be us looking for more instructors, partly because I want someone that can teach digital, like this type of stuff, but digital. And there's not many people that do it. It's going to be tough to find someone. But I'm looking for them because I just have so many students now that want to work digitally, which is smart, you know, because like the whole industry works pretty much digital now. If you want to get into like concepting or whatever, you know, like you got to be able to do digital art. But it's the one thing I don't do, you know, and like it's interesting because all the concepts work the same. You know, like whether you're working digitally or traditionally, shape, value, edge, construction, all that stuff works exactly the same, no matter what medium you're using. But what's frustrating is I get students that are like, man, I don't know how to make these types of edges with this program. And that's the part I don't know is how to use those programs because I don't use them. And for me, like part of the reason I got into this is because... At the time, before this, I had a number of computer jobs. They weren't art related. They were all like networking, IT type jobs. And I reached a point where I was like, I don't know if I like working with computers all the time. Partly just out of the fact that I didn't want to spend a ton of time, like literally my whole life in front of a computer screen. And so I started doing this, right? Which is like, you know, not computer related at all. And so now, like, everybody wants to work digitally, and I have, like, no digital drawing skills. So I'm going to find somebody that does. In the meantime, I'm going to hopefully learn a little bit of Procreate or something. But, uh... Yeah, anyway, this is pretty much it. This is the end. We have reached the end of the stream. Well, it might be good to have a little bit of a shadow pattern in the ear. It's a little weird having shadow everywhere but there. Look at this whole thing. Looks pretty good. I see a question. The computer is so far away from me. Uh, off topic message. Looking forward to, oh, landscape classes. I saw that one. To the live stream, sir. I saw that one. Ah, Luis wrote, Brian, is there a way to draw a soft edge in a cross hatching way? Yes, there is a way to draw a soft edge. In fact, that's what they do in inking, right? So depending on what you want to do, I would recommend studying some inking, but that's exactly what they do like in comic books, you know, is like they're dealing with line. And so they're trying to find ways to create soft edges with line, right? So say we have, I don't know, like a cylinder Right, and say it's going to be lit where our shadow is going to be like across here. And then maybe we get like a cast shadow kind of coming out this way a little bit. Right, and in comic books and inking, what they're trying to do is figure out how to use line to show a soft edge. You know, and that's what they're doing with the hatching. And you can do that here. And, and that's part of what's cool about these tools. Like regular charcoal you can't do a lot of hatching. You can do a little bit maybe, but with this tool specifically, you can get really, you can get like pencil level lines, right? Like I can come in here and do like hatching. I don't, didn't do much of it here, but I could, but I'll show you kind of what I was talking about, right? So in comic books, they would come in here and say, okay, let's have some hatching like across here, right? And then maybe across this way as well. You 
you know, and so you'll see them ink. You know, in a way that kind of builds up those those lines. You know, and then the edge of this shadow would be here, and then you would kind of like hatch kind of out like that way from there. As you can see, it's been a little while since I've done some inking. You know, then like in comics, then you would go in and on, fix this. You know, you would go in and fill all this stuff in with black. Like this would be black, black, black. You know, and then this would be your edge, but it would all be done with like kind of hatch type marks. So yeah, if you want to do more hatching and you like that look, do some inking. Because inking is where you learn all of that stuff. And uh, you can learn it here too. I mean, we could do some of that here for sure. And, and I don't know if I want to do it, because if I do it in just like a one little area, it's going to look a little bit odd. So I don't think I'm going to do it on here. But yeah. And then, of course, like there's hatching, which was kind of like this, and then cross hatching. You know, so if you get into cross hatching, then it's a matter of figuring out like, okay, how do we get two sets of things here to look you know, like we're creating like a specific form. Which is actually really fun. I should do more of it. Because I do, in fact, that's one of the things I, I plan on doing over this next year is more like comic book style drawing. Because that's really what I like. I mean, that's partly why I got into this. And uh, I want to do more of it. You know, I want to do figure invention. And like comic book style figure invention is what I want to teach. A class kind of like that and then it'll kind of correspond with like an inking type class where we get more into like cross hatching and and stuff like that and then what's cool is you can take that information and apply it back to this and actually create like a combination of the two that's part you know like soft type edges and part hatching you know and kind of combine them a little bit which is really fun anyway this is the end so hopefully let's see what else Edges in a cross hatching way. Hope you find. Oh, Ryden. Hope you find the instructions you need. I was just thinking how the critique concept is really new and useful on the internet. That's cool. There's a few other places that kind of do it, but not like I do. I think. I don't know. I know there's other places you can get critiques, but I think they're more like group critiques where they do like a live stream and then they just like make you watch some critiques. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure how it works at other schools because I didn't go to those schools. But I do know there's places around that offer stuff that's similar, but I don't know if it's quite the same. I don't know. Cool. Anyway, this is pretty much it. So Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. And uh, happy new year. I hope your, your year goes well and you do lots of drawing. Lots of drawing and learn lots of new stuff. And uh, this is the end. I will see you guys later. Except it's going to be a little bit awkward because Olivia is in the other room. I and I have to stand up and walk over there and push the button to I'm stop the stream. Oh, she's back. I'm back to help. Yeah, I didn't realize that until after I said it. I was like, <laughs> oh wait, no, I'm still.